starting. Okay, welcome. Welcome to our uh, panel here on resetting geopolitics to support shared humanity. I'm Dawn Ely, and I am here with our fellow panelists, um, J.D. Gordon and Pascal Siegel. And so before we get started, I want to uh, do some introductions uh, for our illustrious panel here. Um, we're so pleased to have them. So J.D. Gordon, um, J.D. is a former Pentagon spokesman who served during the George, D George W. Bush administration. He later became a senior national security and policy advisor to U.S. national political figures, including Donald Trump, Mike Huckabee, and Herman Cain. Following the presidential election of 2016, during which he served as the Huckabee campaign's chief foreign policy advisor and later the Trump campaign's director of national security, Gordon's formally recommended for the position of Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs in the Trump administration. Gordon has represented multiple think tanks and foundations based in Washington, D.C. as a senior fellow and advisor. He's been a columnist and contributor to The Washington Times, The Daily Caller, The Hill, and USA Today, as well as a television commentator with uh, One America News, Newsmax, Fox News, Sky News, Univision, and Telemundo. Guest speaker appearances have included the U.S. Congress, various national and international parliaments, universities, including Oxford and Georgetown, as well as conferences and summits in over a dozen countries on three continents. He has a bachelor's in communication from Penn State, a master's in diplomacy from Norwich University, and a certificate in negotiations from Harvard Law School. Welcome, J.D. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Don. Thank you for that kind introduction. Excellent. Thank you. And so I'd now like to introduce Pascal Siegel. Pascal is a managing director at Ankara, Ankara Consulting, who brings 20 years of experience in international affairs, analysis specializing in sociopolitical and cross-cultural communications issues. She oversees research on Europe and Russia, and she leverages her analytical skills, regional expertise, professional networks, and overseas living experience to offer timely and objective analysis on threats, risks, and opportunities across her domains of responsibility. Prior to joining Ankara, Pascal led a DHS public-private partnership program designed to foster cross-pollination between the public and private sectors in support of counter, in support of counter -terror terrorism communications efforts. And she's led geostrategic, geostrategic, say that three times fast, uh, simulations to help public and private clients assess the strategic environment and chart the optimal course of action in response to complex security challenges. Areas for her analysis include Brexit, refugees, corruption, infrastructure, education, foreign militaries, and the countries of Syria, Libya, Europe, continents of Europe, uh, other um, entities such as the Pope, Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, Serbia, the Middle East generally, and various terrorist, extremist, and criminal networks and ideologies around the world. She's provided her analysis for a variety of clients and constituents that include several governments and multilateral organizations that include the U.S. and NATO and other private organizations. She has an all but dissertation in um, master's in political science, a master's in security studies, a B.A. in history and political science from the University of Toulouse and an associate degree in journalism from the University of Tours. So welcome, Pascal. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, and it's great to be back um, at the Horace's meeting. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. And so I, again, um, Dawn Ely, I am an author, a founder, and CEO of Palladium Group International and the organization of Liberate from Hate. Um, and that is the CEO of for profit enterprise Palladium Group International. Um, I have been a C-level executive for more than 20 years, having managed multi-million and billion dollar divisions while providing strategic direction across, across global business units, turning $750 million productions into $1 billion productions in less than three years. I'm a frequent speaker and leader of seminars on various topics in the areas of life sciences, international trade and business, personal empowerment, self-development, leadership, culture, conflict, and conflict management. I've developed various educational forums that include a radio show, a podcast, personal corporate development programs, and a contributing writer to various outlets on these topics. I've served as the president of the World Trade Center for Atlanta and on several international boards and executive committees, having turned much of my time now to personal international development and conflict management programs that liberate individuals and communities from the bondages of hate and conflict, one of which was requested to be put into a book form and was published last fall. Hundreds of individuals have participated in these programs with revolutionary results. I'm a double major graduate from the University of Virginia and the Distinguished Honors Curriculum of Political and Social Thought, as well as English. 
I'm also a law graduate from Mercer University in process of education from Harvard University in World Religions and also a Master's in Divinity and Peacemaking. So I want to welcome everybody to um, our topic today, which is on resetting geopolitics to support a shared humanity. And the questions posed to us in this panel are, despite the need to solve COVID-19 and meet the challenges of many UN goals, several nations are relatively underperforming. Are there people well enough informed with clear arguments of the global risks? Can they reform their government's goals to meet a common good throughout through international cooperation? And so I'd like to start us off by creating a, a kind of a landscape um, and start with a foundation. And really, I think the success of this international um, global humanity perspective really depends on our views of ourselves in the world and others. And the others, do we have an us versus them mentality and view of these others? Or do we have a global common good shared humanity, it's all us kind of view? If our countries and our citizenries have an us versus them view of others, then it's going to be characterized by fear, mistrust, win-lose, and how do I solve this and what's in my interests. It's going to be characterized by a go-it-alone, nativist, populist, nationalist, isolationist view of, their, of themselves and others. It will be about my rights before your health or before anything that, contain, that pertains to you. Or do we have a global common good shared humanity in which we will have a shared information, a desire to share information, both contributing and receiving? And it'll be about service to others and how do we solve this? It's a team sport. It will involve multilateral organization participation with public health benefit of others and interests of the whole over the interests of the individuals. And when we are in this um, win-lose us-them mindset, however, we won't share or receive information. We won't trust others. We don't care as much about others, so we don't participate in the team approach, multilateral organizations and otherwise. We go it alone. And often it comes from a marginalized mindset where we either fear of being marginalized or we think we have been marginalized, and we fear not being in front or winning. It's based on beliefs of separation, fear, and lack, whether of ourselves or others. It's always me first. This me first or me only attitude of separation is a view that says we don't share the same humanity or I don't care about you even if we do share the same risks, circumstances and interests. I will make sure I get to the finish line first and if I have to run you over to do it, so be it. There is a no win-win in this mindset. It's always win-lose and me versus you. And this is what is behind so much of the nationalist, nativist, isolationist, populist mindsets that are behind many countries' governmental systems and citizenry attitudes. We've seen it in the rise in the populist citizenries and governments, the U.S., some, several in Central Eastern Europe, Poland, Czech Republic, even in the U.K. with Brexit. So the sabotaging of the us as well, but it is, can be very sabotaging for even the us's to have that attitude of us versus them, as well as the them's, because it will all affect each other. We don't benefit from others' experiences. We don't participate in multilateral organizations. We see this in the results of COVID in these countries, how various countries have managed their COVID responses. We see it in the top worst results. We can take even just the top six worst results of countries in terms of the number of cases per capita of their population. The worst is the Czech Republic. They have a populist, my rights more important than your health government over ruling experts. They refuse to lock down and being reactive instead of strategically listening to others. Bahrain, the second worst uh, statistics in terms of number of cases per capita. Serious human rights violations, clearly not about shared humanity on any level. Slovenia, the third worst experience of COVID. Populist, nationalist, socialist, many objected to the restrictions, a lot of which we saw here in the U.S. as well. Sweden. The number fourth worst, refused to have a community health priority to have lockdowns and mandated distances compared to other Nordic countries with lockdowns and public health orientation. And we saw that in the results. Serbia is the fifth worst, reluctance to lock down. They put in dollars and independence of law over the lives of others. They had a wide open winter ski season and entertainment environment instead of lockdowns. The US, sixth worst in the world in terms of cases per capita 
a reluctance to lock down, internal conflicts, populist, nationalist, my rights greater than your health, not trusting others. We can do it better and we won't be controlled or marginalized by others' rules and recommendations. We look at even a country like Belgium, number 12th. And they themselves even said, individualism, regional internal divisions, and fragmented governance contributed greatly to their poor results. The most successful countries will be those who balance the rights of the public with the rights of the individuals and who approach all aspects of their society and governance as being part of a whole, not in the egoic me first or me only mindsets. So we'll see some more of that uh, as we hear from our panelists. And so I'd like to now introduce um, JD. And uh, JD is going to give us uh, his thoughts on the topic and uh, introduce us to his perspective for four minutes. Thank you very much, Dawn. I really appreciate the kind introduction and I appreciate Frank Jorgen Richter for inviting me back to appear at another Harass Us a Global Forum. Thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be here. What I would like to talk about is the public health credibility crisis from COVID. I recently had a column in The Spectator that detailed that since we do have this public health credibility crisis, since the experts have been so often wrong globally, uh, that's created a real problem of legitimacy for governments around the world. And we see that particularly uh, in the United States with our uh, top medical expert, Dr. Tony Fauci, who has been uh, our top medical expert for studying infectious diseases since 1984, when he's been, uh, when, when he started as a director there, uh, he's been wrong very often. And so um, when he's been right, um, unfortunately, that gets politicized versus uh, versus just an objective fact-based approach. So he has fans that say, well, fans on the political left, generally Democrats that, that just defend everything he does, and then fans, uh, rather detractors, critics on the political right, who attack everything he does. So unfortunately, since he has been wrong so often, it just gets very politicized. So I think moving forward, one of the best ways to, to stop pandemics from being so deadly in the future, we're already up to 3.7 million deaths approximately from COVID around the world. One of the ways to actually help prevent it from being so serious in the future for, for COVID and other pandemics is to see what countries did right. I had shared a, a website with, with you the other day called statista.com. Uh, and in that, you can see the, the countries around the globe and how they did in a very uh, varying statistics. One of them that leapt out to me was the, the top 20 countries uh, in terms of uh, deaths per million inhabitants and the, the worst uh, 20, the top 20 and the worst 20. So if you look at the, the top 20 countries that, that uh, uh, avoided deaths, that, that were better. What did they do right? We mentioned some examples at the beginning. Uh, you, you mentioned some countries in Europe and some of the, the, the stats they had in, in numbers of cases per, uh, per capita. Well, let's talk about some of the countries that did some things right. Uh, the, those 20 countries were countries that were islands, for instance, like New, Z New Zealand, uh, which implemented lockdowns and travel restrictions right away. They acted quickly. That's a big lesson learned. Other ones are in Southeast Asia, like uh, Vietnam and Laos. Uh, they acted quickly, and also they don't have a lot of people going to to, to Laos and Vietnam. Uh, if you look at other ones in that top 20 that avoided deaths, a uh, high end of deaths, most of them were in Sub-Saharan Africa, where a lot of people don't travel. And also, if you look at the, the number of deaths you get, 80 to 90 percent of them are uh, the elderly with comorbidities. So if you look at a place like uh, Laos and Vietnam, you, you have a, a, a po population that's generally more fit. Uh, they don't have the, uh, the, the problem with obesity and the, the, um, the, the uh, heart disease, uh, hypertension that you do in the worst countries. The worst countries, the, the top 20 worst countries were all in Europe, North America and South America where you have a, a lot of comorbidities among the elderly. That's why the death rate was so high. And if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they don't have the type of obesity that we see in the West as well. So if you look at uh, the, the key actions, taking actions right away, 
implementing travel restrictions right away. We didn't implement them in the United States. Uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Fauci said that uh, that they'd be relevant to implement travel restrictions from China. Well, that really hurt the United States and it hurt Europe, and it hurt Latin America. But in New Zealand, they, they locked travel down from China right away. And they instituted a national lockdown right away in, in February of 2020. And they were able to lift it by June of 2020. So you, you have to hold up countries, I believe, like New Zealand, like Iceland, uh, countries that, uh, that that took it seriously, that acted right away. And also just look at the, the reality is if you have a population with a lot of obesity, hypertension, uh, heart disease, um, lung problems, uh, COPD, emphysema, you're asthma, you're going to have more deaths just because of the health of the population. So I think those are the key takeaways. Uh, and the last one I'd say is, is the world needs to depoliticize COVID as much as possible. It's been so political in so many countries. That doesn't help anything to make it so political. Fantastic. Thank you so much, J.D. Thank you. Um, so, Pascal, I'd love to hear your opening statement now for f four minutes or so, and let us know your perspective on the topic. Sure. Uh, so, first of all, thank you very much very much for your kind introduction um, and it's great to be back here um, at Horses. Um, so the point, the point I want to make is that if we needed a poster child for how dysfunctional the international system has become, COVID is it. Um, the international system has changed quite a lot in the last two decades. Okay, the multilateral system that the United States largely uh, built after World War II has frayed significantly. There is less consensus today than, you know, before. There are many more actors, many more states, and many um, non-state actors. Um, and the relative power of these different actors has also changed significantly. You know, when the U.S. started building this system, it weighted 75% of global GDP. Today, it's 22. You don't lead the same way when you weigh, you know, 7,400 pounds and 220 pounds. Um, a key change, of course, in this system has been the rise of China to the rank of second largest economy in the world with and, you know, as it grows and it becomes more powerful, it yields, um, you know, more power through it is more assertive militarily. It is more assertive economically um, through the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, I'd say that we've witnessed the wear and tear of the U.S. power both the hard power and the soft power. Um, as a result, we're increasingly facing an international system driven by competition rather than um, cooperation. And the, in that kind of system, the negative leverage, so where, you know, countries edge each other and use restrictive policy or punishing measures to achieve that way. Um, you know, I mean, that kind of negative leverage then becomes more prevalent. Um, so, you know, if you cannot get your way because, you know, by enticing others, by making win-win propositions, then you tend to um, to gravitate toward restrictive and negative measures to try to protect your interest. Um, this is not a new system. Um, you know, it prevailed in in Europe for over a century during the nineteen um, the nineteen the the eighteen and in the early nineteen hundreds. Unfortunately, these systems tend to be fairly unstable, and as far as Europe is concerned, it ended up. It, yeah, it ended up in World War I. Um, so we probably don't want to, you know, we want to have a reset before we get to, to a redo of that. Um, and in, in that regard, um, 
COVID should be seen really, I mean, the COVID management should be really a wake up call um, to the international community. Um, COVID is absolutely an unprecedented public health crisis and an economic calamity on a global scale. JD was mentioning 3.7 million dead, um, you know, due to COVID. Well, according to the WHO, if you add, you know, the excess mortality, so people who did not die necessarily of COVID, but die because they could not get the care that they need because, you know, public health system are uh, overwhelmed by COVID, we could be as high as 8 million dead. Um, the direct costs, economic costs of, of COVID um, amount to something in the neighborhood of $11 trillion. Missed earning in the neighborhood of $10 trillion. I mean, this is, this is a quarter of global GDP. Um, no region in the world has been spared. So our international system, to avoid that kind of calamity, our international system was unable to put together the 40 billion roughly that it would have been necessary to invest in to prepare for the pandemic. Yeah, so you know, that's... that's um, Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I think you've brought up a really good point that I'd like to explore a little bit further um, in terms mm -hmm. of some specific questions that maybe we can sure. um, dive a little bit deeper in. And um, and so, you know, playing off of Pascal, what you just said, um, I'd like to give you both an opportunity to answer the question in terms of, you know, when you look at sort of the geopolitical landscape globally says nobody was untouched by this mm -hmm. because it sort of was an, on some level an even playing field in terms of everybody being affected, but everybody being affected in different ways and to different degrees. When you look at the, the commonalities or the similar things, is there a commonality in how countries fared in COVID and their view of either a shared international cooperation, a shared humanity? Was there any commonality or, or in, you know, indicative characteristics that you saw from a geopolitical standpoint of how people view the world and how they fared in COVID? I'd like to pose that first to you, JD. Uh, I didn't see enough of a global community to try to solve COVID. I saw too much uh, politicization, I'd say, uh, the World Health Organization is nominally supposed to be uh, l taking the lead in these type of endeavors. And what I saw is uh, that they just helped China, essentially, to say whatever they wanted them to say. And uh, the World Health Organization was aware that there was an outbreak in January. By January of 2020, they had sent a team to China and yet they were still repeating some of the things that the Chinese were saying, that they haven't seen evidence of human to human trans transmission. And because that happened, we still had a lot of travel between China, the United States and Europe in those three places. And so, so much of the world's economy with the world's top two economies being the U.S. and China. And uh, uh, of course, the, the EU is, is an enormous economic block as well. Those are the three top economies, essentially, if you add the EU block. And so there's a lot of travel between them. And there was not enough of an effort to come together and react quickly to say, look, it's going to hurt us economically, but we have to engage in travel restrictions right away, just like New Zealand was doing. New Zealand was acted in the most responsible fashion of any country I've studied. Singapore did very well as well uh, with travel restrictions. And it is an island. You can, of course, get over to Malaysia from a bridge, uh, which I took that trip when I was in the Navy in the 90s. I walked across that bridge to Malaysia. But Singapore was able to lock the country down, too, and, and put in place very, very uh, rigid travel restrictions. So now that COVID is starting to fade somewhat, Countries are opening up again, but the, the big lesson learned, I would say, is that we did not see enough 
global cooperation we need to see in the future for travel restrictions. That is the big thing that stops it from from literally traveling. You're not going to get sick human to human transmission if people aren't coming into your country as much as they were. Yeah. And do you see that uh, any um, um, connection between the quick reaction that leaders had and what they view as their role in a, in a global community? Or do you see those as completely separate? Uh, I do see some type of tie between them. Uh, unfortunately, the countries that did the best are very small countries, uh, generally, uh, and islands. So they have it easier in a lot of ways. And people could just say, well, you're just an island. So it's easier said than done, easy to keep people out like New Zealand, like Iceland, like Singapore. But uh, I would say that that the world community should listen to them more now since we already have the data. We know which which countries were the top 20 best and which were the top 20 worst. It, it's, it, it's, it's pretty plain. It's not politicized. You could say, what did the top 20 do that the bottom 20 didn't? So yeah. it's pretty obvious. They, they should play more of a leadership role, uh, I think, and they will moving forward because they have – the facts and the evidence on their side. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, excellent answer, JD. Thank you so much. Pascal, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so I agree with JD that there was not enough global cooperation. I mean, you see it, you know, we, we have not been able to manage the, the PPE production and trade to meet the global needs, and we still don't. I mean, the, you know, third wave that has hit India and Brazil very, very hard. They are still missing PPE. They are still missing oxygen, et cetera. So that's, uh, I mean, you know, that's absolutely terrible. We're also not able to ascertain how this pandemic started. We, we have, you know, we have questions, certainly, and there is, you know, collecting of data, but these are largely private um, uh, you know, investigations. I mean, people, you know, epidemiologists, virologists who do this um, out of the goodness of their heart, basically, it is not institutional and this is not the way that we're going to learn the lesson, implement the fixes and avoid COVID-25. Um, and... and I was just going to say, I'm just going to throw this question uh-huh. out to you in, sure. in the context of, of, of your answer is, uh, what role do you see and do you see the multilateral organizations being able to facilitate this? And, you know, how, how do you see that in, the, in this context? To me, this is, uh, this is not a question of the WHO. The WHO does not have the powers to call the shots. It's, it doesn't have enforcement powers. It cannot dictate um, the rules, of the terms of engagement, let's say, you know, for investigating, uh, investigative teams. Um, it's also a question of everybody coming to the table and saying, look, this is a threat to the world and we have to act collectively, together. So this is not about, you know, blaming, you know, X, Y, or Z for, yeah, you didn't do this on time, you didn't do that on time. It's about setting the processes by which we are going to avoid a repeat. Um, And as far as, okay, we know who did well, who didn't, I would I would take, um, I would be maybe just a tad more cautious than JD in the sense that we we have really serious question about the quality of the data that's out there. Um, You know, because of honest mistakes, because of lack of testing, um, inequality access to, to testing because of, you know, fudging numbers and, quite frankly, deliberate lies. You know, the first thing is to collect and clean the data, then, you know, and then correct for a number of things that we know have 
an impact on the death rates, which is, you know, population aging, um, you know, comorbidity factors and all this. Then we can have maybe um, maybe a, a clean slate. Yeah. And we can start to we can start to build on this. But yeah, I mean, it starts with having good, uh, reliable data that everyone can trust. Mm-hmm. We're not there yet. Yeah. Um, and do you see anything about a um, any change in mindset, any change or shift in policies in terms of the view and perspective of a shared humanity, or is it just every country out for itself and using whatever they can from the the global, or is it um, is it mind sh- mindset shift in your opinion? Uh, I think that it's not it's not necessary. It's not a question of mindset. I think that a lot of people in a lot of governments um, and outside of governments are are people who want to get things done and who want, you know in um, for the benefit of humanity. It's just we're now at a point where the system there are so many competing um, imperatives into the system and competing interests and competing actors that we cannot get. Everybody is is extremely constrained in what they can or want to do. Um, I think it's a question of that. And I don't think that it's just, oh, by you know, changing Joe Biden's mindset that we are going to get where we need to be or Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin or, you know, Jay Bolsonaro. Um, I think that we have also seen, and I agree with JD, a very, very high level of politically motivated malfeasance, um, you know, about what public um, health measures work or not that have caused tens of thousands of deaths. Yeah. You know, um, so now I'd like to um, have us move into our closing statements now that we have about 13 minutes left. And, you know, I'd like to draw on a couple of things that each of you have said. And, you know, both of you have looked at the political motivation and mentioned political motivation with respect to COVID, the numbers and the procedures. And certainly there is a Um, capabilities and systems and resources that are involved in the actual implementation of any kind of COVID response and ability to um, mobilize resources and mobilize changes in activities, behaviors, and anything else on system-wise to deal with a COVID infrastructure or COVID um, response like this. But as I begin my closing statement, then we'll move to you all. I am going to make the statement, I think, that a lot of the COVID success and failures mirrors a country's view of the world and their role in it and their view of the others in the world. And I think, to J.D.'s point, the islands, having had such a great success in the COVID response, I think they have a history of realizing that, you know, they are an island, and in order to succeed, they actually have to be much more proactive and much more cooperative and collaborative around the world. And I think that is a mirror of, um, of their mindset, of their role in, in that. And I think those countries who have felt like there is a different mindset of the need to collaborate or other kind of uh, reason why they would um, be responsive or not so much or collaborative or not so much is really about their mindset and the way they view themselves in the world. And I think that a lot of these countries have had the us versus them mentality. They've been in a lot of us versus them political, geopolitical kind of struggles for a lot of their 
their political lives and for many decades. And that fear and mistrust um, are beliefs and attitudes that come from a certain consciousness state that says it's an us versus them world, eat or be eaten, kill or be killed kind of uh, environment. And in my perspective, those will never produce productive or effect effective leadership, government regimes, or a shared humanity viewpoint for very long. And certainly not in terms of a real multilateral cooperative and approach to a global risk or situation. And I believe that that's an egoic mindset and that the alternative to that is one that does not see fear and lack and mistrust everywhere, but instead is the higher self-consciousness state. It's the conscience, the service to others the serve versus the service to self attitude of, of an ego. And we, we have to stop believing that we can be our best, higher spiritual self in our personal lives and then someone different in our professional lives. And that includes how we create and lead political systems. The geographic divide in our world politics is somewhat instructive, I think, in how and where we see a more egoic versus us versus them mentality with fear and mistrust mentalities or me only, me first, or I'm the biggest, baddest person in the, in the area and I can do whatever I want. And that has typically been in less economically powerful regions of the world where these, the more of the um, higher self-consciousness state. And Europe and North America have been, you know, typically the less fearful and mistrusting areas with greater economic power and success than in the Southern Hemisphere regions with Africa and South America, along with the Asian regions, where they were historically the less economically powerful, as, as Pascal, you mentioned, and the, yet the most mistrusting where Russia, USSR, China, most of Africa, Brazil, Argentina have been. But as the economic success, particularly of Asia, Asia, changes, the geopolitical world is changing with it. And along with it are the ego consciousness of those who were previously on top. And those citizenries and political leaders are starting to feel fear and mistrust of others now. The U.S., the European countries having elected leaders that are more populist and nativist. These are the areas who have fared far worse in the COVID response. In order to change the us versus them, win, lose, fear and mistrust attitudes towards others, we must elect leaders who act from and who live from their higher selves, not their egoic selves. And that doesn't mean we don't use wisdom and knowing and seeing when another country or our citizens are true in truth wanting to harm us. But we gain true wisdom from our leaders when they are in the consciousness states of their higher selves where, where they don't see through the lens of fear, mistrust and service to self. We have to elect leaders who reflect, however, we do elect leaders who reflect the citizenry at that time. And that means that we as citizens must heal our own fears, mistrust, and us, them, win, lose consciousness states before we can elect leaders who appeal and reflect that different consciousness state. So this means that as members of this global human race, we must all individually hear and clear, heal and clear our own wounds that drive us to our ego consciousness states of fear, mistrust, and us, them, win, lose protectionist views of others in the world. And the collective will change only as a result of the collection of individual changes. So we must stop pointing fingers at everyone else in the world and start with our own houses, our own consciousness states and lenses through which we see others in the world. And when we do that, we'll gain access to the real wisdom and not the false wisdom or illusions that fear and mistrust brings. So, J.D., love to hear your final words on the matter. In conclusion, I would like to thank both of you for your excellent comments and great points and insights, and also thank again uh, Frank, Jörg, and Richter for the kind invitation. I think in order to solve these type of pandemics in the future and to lessen their severity, the, the global community has to do a better job of coming together uh, and enacting things like travel restrictions right away and taking it seriously right away and not getting so bogged down into politics so many of the countries that have done very poorly in Europe and North America and Latin America have very divisive politics. Uh, if you look at some of those islands that I mentioned in the top 20 group who did the best, uh, the politics are, are not, so, not as vicious. <laughs> and so I think if you look at a place, like I, I mentioned again, New Zealand, I've never been there, would love to go one day, but 80% uh, of the people apparently approved of the travel restrictions and lockdowns. I have a hard time imagining 80% of the people in America, in the United States, approving anything in common. This day, yeah, so exactly. We have to get over those political divisions in order to solve this for the future. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, Pascal, tell us your thoughts. So, I think I would say this um, COVID is not over. 
And our international system has really failed, you know, last year um, to handle the, the pandemic on, on a global scale. Right. Some countries have managed, some countries are managing the vaccination better than others. Some countries have managed the, the pre-vaccine, you know, the, the, the pandemic um, itself better than others. But the crisis is not over. We need to get to um, vaccination rates that are, you know, protective everywhere in the world. And we can correct course today if we take the measures that are um, that will allow speed up and increase the production of vaccine at a cost that countries can afford. And that should be the primary focus today. We we've made an enormous we, we've made a, you know a scientific miracle producing these vaccines safe, effective, you know, and quickly. Now we need to scale up to, to the globe. And it's the jobs of the governments, of the multinational organizations, and of the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we do have a few more extra minutes. And so wanted to see if um, either of you have anything else to add to the topic that we didn't get a chance to cover. I would add one more thing uh, where uh, I agreed very much with uh, Pascal and I didn't get a chance to, to comment after it. And that is about looking at the data for all the countries. As some of the countries uh, I could trust uh, uh with actually I could not trust at all. I could trust them as far as like throw them for some of the countries putting out information about their own COVID rates, their mortality rates. Uh, Iran is a country I could cite. I, I don't believe anything coming out of the government of Iran. Uh, if you look at China, China is actually on that top 20 best list for COVID mortality. I'm not sure I believe that. So uh, I, I think you could just look at trends the top mm -hmm. 20 country trends, the bottom uh, 20 country trends without uh, holding up one specific country like a China or like an Iran for saying, well, okay, I trust that they're in the group they say they are. Because some countries, obviously, you can't trust. Yeah, and I think in that regard, one thing I didn't say, um, but I, as I was looking at the best, you find the people who, the countries that are at the best are more of the authoritarian type of, of regimes um, and either they either mandate and require and have zero respect for human rights and it's all a hundred percent you do what we say and everything's for the public benefit you know so those aren't necessarily where we want to model ourselves either and so if you look at sort of in the, the middle you know, right. kind of middle, the top third, that's really where the successes are because they balance the rights of the individual with the collective individual or the collective um, interests of public health. And so there is a balance. And that's really what success is, is balance. It doesn't, you don't want it to be either end of the seesaw, right? The individual rights can't reign supreme and you can't suppress individual rights so that there aren't anything and everything is always about everybody else. So, you know, that's where we have to look at that balance. And um, democracy is where there's some type of government transparency, uh, a free press and, and those type of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's way too early um, to draw, you know, conclusions on how uh, different systems um, have failed in managing the, the pandemic. Um, because one, as I said earlier, the data, you know, the data is just not there. And second, we need to correct the data that we collect, I mean, the, the rates that we collect for what we know impact um, the, the mortality rate, which is age and comorbidity. comorbidity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not the data scientist. I cannot do this. Um, but this is really key. We, we need to have that information before we draw um, 
any kind of conclusions. The um, also, you know, the idea of comparing, you know, how Taiwan managed um, the pandemic to how the United States managed it is, you know, the two countries are so different, you know, uh, scale, traffic, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, the amount of travel, etc. I mean, it's it's very hard to do. Um, it's a completely different process. To, yeah, comparison yeah. to comparison. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's certainly easier, as I think JD mentioned, to control the ports of entry on an island than it is, um, you know, on a contiguous country. Right. You know, well, yeah. Between absolutely. driving, but also something that's as large as the United States or Canada, where you have hundreds of international airports, not just, you know, right. all that. Yeah. And of course, you know, as you both mentioned, the trustworthiness of the data from the authoritarian regimes is, you know, <laughs> Yes, Good the point. authoritarian regimes are not the only ones who fudge the numbers. Well, that's Let's also put this. Right? Everybody Let's has their own interest. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for having uh, for joining this panel and and having and participating in creating a wonderful conversation that was uh, had lots of aspects.